We are, all of us, trapped in a policy world where prison is the default response to crime. Prison is seen as normal. Last year, there were 10.35 million people in the world in prison. That had increased by 20% since the year 2000, increasing at a rate faster than global population growth. And the world's female prison population had increased by a massive 50% between the year 2000 and 2015. At the same time, our imaginations are caged. We can't think through alternatives to prison. And what I want us to consider today is whether we can escape prison, whether we can break free of this default response to criminal offending and liberate our imaginations to develop alternatives to mass incarceration. I first went to prison in my early 20s, partly because I was lucky enough to grow up in a home where I had food on the table and I got a good education, and partly because I'm a member of an ethnic group that doesn't face stereotyping or discrimination, I went to prison as a law student, not as an inmate. But I'll never forget the two prisons I visited in New Zealand. The first had long, white corridors. It felt like a hospital. It was sterile, and I felt as if the ceilings were pressing down towards me, suffocating me. The second was quite different. I remember opening up the blue gates of Mount Eden Prison and hearing the sound of screeching metal and shouting inmates and smelling a stench that I can only compare to a farm. And this brings me to the first of four problems I want to talk about with prison. Prisons are inhumane. All of us need social contact for our well-being. We need love and social connectedness and relationships. And prisons deprive individuals of that social contact that makes us human. It cuts prisoners off from their families, often leaving families in a state of shame and stigma. It invariably produces cycles of intergenerational offending where prisoners have children. And unfortunately, prisons all around the world are hubs for suicide and sexual assault. This is not how we should treat human beings. But secondly, prisons are a cipher for racial prejudice. At every stage of our criminal justice system, we know that ethnic minorities in most countries are overrepresented. When police make arrests, when judges sentence. But this problem is particularly pernicious when it comes to sending people to prison. In New Zealand, Māori, the indigenous group, make up 15% of the general population and 50% of the prison population. In the United States of America, African Americans make up 17% of the general population and 39% of the prison population. In the United Kingdom, black British people make up 2.2% of the general population, 17% of the prison population. We know some of the explanations for this, underlying deprivations, institutional racism, but we don't have a complete explanation for why this institutional racism is particularly bad when it comes to prisons. But recent work by a Danish political scientist, Michael Ban Pedersen, offers a possible answer. Michael Ban Pedersen talks about something called associational value. He says that when we punish, and he points to supporting evidence for this in both animals and humans, we punish with not only the seriousness of an offense in mind, but also the associational value we attach to the offender. What he means by that is the perceived value of interacting with a person in future. And so if we live in a society where there are warped racial prejudices that seep down into the minds of those sentencing offenders, it's plausible that a lower associational value will be attached to members of ethnic minority groups helping to explain this overrepresentation in prisons. Thirdly, prisons hide from social view our most serious social problems. Angela Davis, a prison abolitionist and someone who spent some time in prison herself describes this well when saying, prisons relieve us of the responsibility of engaging with our most serious problems, including problems arising out of racism and increasingly global capitalism. As a result, prisons make it harder for us to resolve those problems because they warehouse those problems and hide them from our view. Lastly, prisons don't even achieve their aims well. Justice should be about more than revenge. But prisons also don't achieve the aims of deterrence or rehabilitation or incapacitation effectively. 
When it comes to deterrence, we know that most offenders don't weigh up the costs and benefits of offending, but when they do, they think more about the chances of being caught as opposed to the punishment that follows offending. That hints that imprisonment doesn't add much to deterrence. When it comes to rehabilitation, we know partly from the high rates of reoffending around the world in places with mass incarceration, that prisons are structurally ill-equipped to deliver rehabilitation. And that makes sense when you see the inside of prisons and realize that prisons are very different from the outside world into which we hope prisoners will return. We can accept, perhaps, that prisons, almost by definition, incapacitate. They remove individuals from a community. But I'm going to suggest they don't even do this well and that there are other ways we could think about developing protective institutions. Now, at this point, you might have a question on the tip of your tongues. You might say it's all very well for this tall softy to talk about how prisons are inhumane, how prisons don't achieve their aims, but don't prisons house some very troubled individuals that pose a threat to the community? I accept that being a victim of crime is horrendous. I know people that have been victims of crime, and victims are a vulnerable group that deserve protection. But first, the number of people in prison that have done very serious offending is far smaller than we all initially think. In most countries, depending on how we define serious offending, somewhere between one-tenth and two-tenths of prisoners. And second, even if we did need a protective institution for a small number of prisoners, it wouldn't look like how prisons are now. So what is to be done? Young people all around the world are clamoring for a new approach. I know this because in New Zealand, I helped to set up a group called Just Speak with some friends, which encouraged young people to speak up about the criminal justice system. You might not think that prison reform or prison abolition would excite busy young people, but we were really heartened by the response. At first, we held monthly forums where 15 or 20 people came. Over time, we had over 100 people regularly attending monthly forums where we heard from prisoners alongside judges. We developed policy submissions, reports, camps involving both people who'd been in trouble with the justice system and people that wanted to change it. And we were told by an ex-politician that we changed the course of the criminal justice debate in New Zealand. But it's not just in New Zealand, it's not just with Just Speak that we see this trend amongst young people. We see in Florida the Dream Defenders taking up this cause and Black Lives Matter standing against mass incarceration in the United States as a whole. My generation is more impatient for change on issues not just like inequality and climate change, but also on incarceration. More imaginative about solutions and perhaps more innovative about how we're going to achieve those solutions. And I think three paths of action need to be pursued, building on these movements of young people and taking along with us the politicians that are starting to move too. First of all, we need to design our prisons differently, perhaps for the serious offenders that still need some form of protective institution. This is Bustoy Prison in Norway. It's a prison on an island which you go to on a ferry from Oslo. The ferry is entirely run by prison inmates. I took this ferry at the end of last year. I arrived at the island to find prisoners doing various forms of work, fishing, agriculture, academic study. And the island and the prison have had no violent incidents for 30 years and has a very low rate of reoffending. The key principle is normality, designing the prison like the outside world. And I think countries could learn a lesson or two from Norway. We could make prisons more of a center for education, more grounded in the principle of normality, more willing to equip people for the outside world. But secondly, we need to go beyond this to something Angela Davis has described as decarceration, a stepped phase out of incarceration. And we can start by focusing on short-term offenders that tend to pose less of a threat to the public. In New Zealand, 85% of people are in prison for two years or less, and there are similar figures in most countries, a figure that might surprise you when you think about what we associate with prisoners based on what we hear in the media. We can start by taking concrete steps, and I want to suggest five, to vastly reduce the size of the prison population and through targeting those offenders. First, we can develop what are known as problem-solving courts, courts that have been trialed successfully in the United States 
which involves supervising the rehabilitation of offenders, particularly drug offenders. I was lucky enough to visit the Red Hook Community Court in New York, which uses this approach and has had very effective results. Secondly, we can look at, perhaps more radically, abolishing short-term sentences altogether, as was done in Belgium a couple of years ago when Belgium announced it would abolish all sentences of one year or less. Thirdly, we could have a conversation about drug law reform, which takes up a number of short-term offenders. Fourthly, we can consider a justice reinvestment model, which involves spending in targeted high crime areas and has been known to work as a way to reduce crime and therefore reduce uh, the number of offenders. And fifthly, we might try more restorative justice, a model used in New Zealand which involves sitting an offender down with a victim, especially for less serious crimes, and forcing the offender to be confronted with the effects of his or her actions. Far from being a soft response, it's a tough response that many offenders find very difficult, but can also reduce our prison population. But thirdly, we need to have a serious conversation about prisoners, inmates, being part of our community. We have an empathy gap when it comes to prisoners, just as we have an empathy gap when it comes to several other sectors of our population. And we need to overcome that empathy gap and see prisoners not as some distant them, but as part of a bigger us. And if we were able to build that surge of empathy, we might be able to create a movement for our time, a movement that draws on creative coalitions of mental health advocates and supporters of fiscal responsibility, human rights lawyers and anti-race activists in order to start decarceration. If we can do this, if we can live up to our highest values, values like love and redemption and hope rather than playing down to our basest fears, then this is a form of prison escape that, yes, challenges conventional wisdom, challenges authority, involves some risks and involves some difficult steps, but is a prison escape that I'd support and that I hope you can all get behind. Thank you for listening.